Good morning and welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. My name is Craig. I'm one of the pastors here, and it really is our privilege to have you with us. It means a lot to me that you would make time to be with us on this Sunday morning. If you have your Bible, in just a minute, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, but uh, in, in the meantime, let me just share a couple of things. Number one, if you're a guest with us, we're so glad that you're here. Um, please do, as Pastor Adam said, fill out a card for us and let us know you were here, either the tear-off or on our website at malvinhill.org slash connect. Also, if you're a guest with us for the first time or the 40th time, this afternoon at 4 o'clock, I will have a meeting. Uh, we call it our Next Steps meeting. I would love for you to come, and you can just find out a little bit more about our church. No commitment. I will not sell you any knives if you come today. I just want to meet with you, have an opportunity to talk to you about who our church is and what we're about. You'd have an opportunity to speak to me, ask me any questions that you might have. So I'd encourage you to be here. I'll meet you right here in the sanctuary at 4 o'clock, and then uh, we'll transition to a smaller space. So I'd invite you to do that. I also just want to reiter reiterate what, what Pastor Adam said. We have barbecue coming up this coming weekend. They're going to be cooking on Wednesday. They're going to be serving. If you would like to help, uh, a lot of men will stand around and watch, watch pork cook on Wednesday, and they would love for you to stand around with them and watch pork cook uh, starting uh, a little bit after lunchtime and all the way until hopefully about midnight, but probably about 3. So um, uh, if you'd like to participate in that, see Pastor Buster if you want to volunteer in any way. Or if you want to buy some barbecue, uh, please see him right up here at the front after the service. He would love to help you with that. All right. Having said that, let me give you a, a cool story. Last Sunday, we had our largest ever attendance for a normal worship service. We had 464 people who were here last Sunday, which is awesome. Um, which also means I don't know any of y'all at all. Like, I just looked around, and I don't know anybody. So here's what we're going to do. Don't move out of your seat. I'm talking to you, April Garbate, wherever you are. Um, look at the people beside you. Just take a minute and tell somebody good morning and introduce yourself to somebody right there around you. That'd be great. Look at that. Good job. Some of y'all are not very good at following directions. All right. All right. All right. And if you're a guest with us and you felt uncomfortable, I want you to know that everybody around you felt uncomfortable because the discomfort right now is that we have so many new faces showing up that nobody knows who to greet. So uh, if you're not sure if the person sitting beside you is a member or not, you're w just welcome to the crowd. Everybody's in the same boat right now. So uh, I had somebody say to me, I, I introduced myself to somebody and welcomed them. They told me they've been coming for three months. So um, if that's how you feel, we're all in this boat together. But I'm so glad that you're here. And the reason that we can't keep up is because God's doing some really great things in lives. And you guys are doing what you're supposed to. You're inviting folks to come. and uh, So we're just excited and eager for all that God is, is doing in our church. And, and by extension, that he's doing in your lives individually. So thank you for being a part of it. Hopefully by now, I told you to turn to John five or Matthew 5, and then I told you to stand up and move. So maybe you kept your finger in your Bible. Matthew chapter 5, we've been working our way through the Beatitudes over the last few weeks. And this morning, we're in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me in honor of God's Word. I'm going to read just this one verse, and then we'll jump into God's Word. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Let's pray together. Father God, I pray that you would show us what it means to be merciful. Lord God, help us to... Help us, Lord God, to put the desires and the deeds of our flesh to death, Lord God, instead to live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Sir Isaac Newton discovered gravity, and, and he did actually discover it by watching apples fall. That's not just one of those old wives' tales or stories that you picked up in elementary school somewhere. That's actually true. He's watching apples fall to the ground, and as a result of that, he began to think, hey, uh, maybe there's something to this. And so he discovered gravity. It wasn't just gravity, though. Isaac Newton also had these three other laws that he, that he formulated. Uh, the first law was um, the law of inertia, and it just talks about things moving, right? The second law is the law of force, um, and it's, it's, so it shows that the, at the acceleration of an object actually depends upon upon the mass of the object and the amount of force applied. For all of our purposes today, you don't need to know about that. But the third one, that's the one I really want to talk about this morning, because the third law that Isaac Newton uh, established for us is the law of action and reaction. And I like to believe that maybe Isaac Newton picked that one up from watching apples as well, because the, the law of action and reaction says that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And I tend to believe that maybe as those apples were falling, one of them hit him in the head. And he began to think, you know what, when that thing hit me, it hurt. When that thing hit me, something happened. And he began to formulate these ideas and understand. When we think about the law of 
action and reaction. Of course, you might think about it with a bat hitting a ball. You might even think about it when two cars collide um, at an intersection. But the law of action and reaction works itself out even in our relationships, doesn't it? You know what it's like when somebody acts in one way and you tend to react. In the office around here, they encourage me not to react but to respond, which is a really good thing. My reaction tends to be visceral. My responses tend to be more measured and logical. Ladies, you know what this is. Your husband comes in, he brings you flowers, and you are supposed to say thank you. That's the response. Don't, don't mess this up, ladies. When he does those, bring those flowers and say, why did you waste money on flowers? That is an inappropriate response. That is a reaction. It is not a reaction that is going to benefit your relationship. Instead, you need to be responding with joy that he thought enough about you on the way home to stop and do that. But this is, this is action and reaction. Well, in the world's economy, in the world's economy, people expect you to react to injustice with revenge. In the world's economy, when something is wrong or something is done to you wrong, the expectation is that you would respond or react in the same like manner, that you would lash out at those who have done you wrong. But in God's economy, and this is what Jesus is teaching us right here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. In God's economy, the expectation is that we would be wronged and that we would respond with mercy. In God's economy, we are expected not to respond as we would want to. In God's economy, mercy is the proper response. And so this morning, with the, the implements of the Lord's Supper laid out in front of us, we're going to consider exactly what it would look like for us to respond in mercy as Jesus has commanded us to do so in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. There's three things that I want us to get from this passage of Scripture this morning. Number one, I want you to know that to respond in mercy, to, to live out this good life beatitude of mercy, the first thing that you've got to be willing to do, you've got to be changed by the gospel. Be changed by the the gospel. The gospel is good news to change your future. The gospel by nature brings about change. Listen to me. If you're not interested in being changed, you're not interested in the gospel. Because the gospel changes you. Jesus said to Nicodemus when he came to him in the dark, he said, you must be born again. The understanding of the gospel is that it changes. It brings people from death to life. One of the, the illustrations the Bible gives is it takes our old stone hearts and he gives us this heart of flesh. He brings us from dead people to living people. He sets us on an eternal trajectory. No longer are we children of hell and wrath. Instead, we are children of God. Y'all listen to me. The gospel changes us. And this is an uncomfortable truth, but it's a truth that we must all embrace. If you're not changed, you've not experienced the gospel. If you're not changed, you've not experienced the gospel. Now, there's some of you right now that are already trying to create some theological loopholes and do some theological acrobatics to get around this. People are always looking for this loophole. Well, pastor, I'm, I'm, maybe they're just backslidden. I was there when my child made a decision 37 years ago. And they're just, they're just away from the Lord. I'm not here today to give you a way out of conviction. I'm, I'm, I'm really not interested in making you feel better about your sinful decisions and your sinful desires. I'm far more concerned with you feeling very uncomfortable in your sin. And finding incredible security in the salvation that your Savior offers. Folks, if you're working diligently to convince yourself that you're saved, why lie to yourself and enter hell when you could embrace the truth and experience forgiveness in Christ? The gospel changes us. It impacts us. And if right now you're trying to come up with some theological argument about why somebody's really saved, 
even though they live like a child of hell. Let me ask you, are you more concerned with them feeling good about where they are today or more concerned with them being feeling good about where they are for eternity? Folks, we will never be wrong for sharing the gospel, but we may be wrong for creating false hope in the lives of those who got wet in a Baptist church or a Methodist church or a Catholic church but never experienced the life-changing truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel changes us. And if you've not been changed, you need to ask if you've ever encountered Jesus. When Paul met Jesus on the Damascus Road, he was never the same again. When Jesus met those disciples by the Sea of Galilee, they were never the same again. This is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, now what is this gospel? This gospel of Jesus Christ is a historical act, it's a historical fact. Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and resurrected from the grave. Easter's coming up. And when Easter arrives, we're going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Man, I'm excited. I'm excited about Easter Sunday. Pastor Kevin's been working with our, our musicians to get things ready. I am geared up. It's the first, first year that we've done Easter with the, our two services. I'm, I'm motivated. I can't wait to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. But folks, the resurrection only matters because he died for our sins. That's historical fact. And he calls you. He invites you to respond. He died for you. I'm not up here to make you feel bad. I'm not up here to make you mad. As a matter of fact, I'm thrilled to death that you're here. And I'm telling you these things because I believe from the bottom of my heart that God has put you in this place today to hear these words that Jesus loves you. That he died to save you from your sin and he rose from the grave. And he longs. He longs with an incredible patience to see you turn from your sin and turn to Him. And I believe from the bottom of my heart that He is grieved when we lie to ourselves and to others about our salvation because we are afraid that we will be judged by those around us. The, the gospel of Jesus Christ changes us. But look at this. The gospel puts a greater weight on our attitude than our actions. See, the gospel begins in our heart. The gospel begins in the attitude of our heart. Now, now we know what Jesus says. Jesus says that the words that come out of our mouth actually proceed from the heart. See, we, we, we actually can, can be judged by our works and our deeds. You don't judge me. You don't know what's in my heart. I love that one. Pastor, you stood up there and said that if people don't act like Jesus, they don't know Jesus. You don't know what's in their heart. You're right. For the record, I can't climb in there. But Jesus said... That the words that come out of our mouth and the actions that come out of our life proceed from our heart. All right? That, that proceeds. In other words, if, if there were a spiritual doctor here and they were trying to diagnose my spiritual condition, they could not see inside of my heart, but they could take note of the things that are coming out of my heart. Right? This is like going to the doctor, and, and the doctor says, I can't see what's in your heart, but let me do a few tests, and they begin to run some things. I had an EKG a while back, um, just because everybody in my family dies of heart disease, like in their early 60s, and so I uh, called my dad. I said, thanks, Dad. I appreciate what you've given me. You've given me an early appointment with a cardiologist. You're so great. Um, but I didn't know this, right? Some of y'all medical people are smarter than me. They hooked me up to their little EKG, and uh, um, I'm laying there, cold with these little leads and I said well how does my heart look and, and they said you know what this this thing can actually detect not only what's happening now it, it can detect if you've had an event in recent history I said man that's wild like you just hook this thing up and they'll know what happened to me but you know what if that thing had shown up anything you know only thing they got out of that was was some symptoms that point they would look to me and said oh it looks like something happened now we need to climb in there and look around and see what we can find Right? Then they'd hook me up to a stress test, and then I'd have had a, a heart catheter, and all the things, because all they could do was, was look at the symptoms. Your actions are the symptoms that tell us about your attitude, and, 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 and they tell us about your heart. And, and the gospel works first to change our attitude. So the, the reality is, we can do the <clears throat> right thing often, 
and still be wrong because we have the wrong attitude in the process. How many of you showed up? How many of you ever showed up to church just mad to be here? I'm thinking about our kids, right? Like how many of them? It's like you're dragging them in the door. I mean, you don't even need to know this. Like, like let's go back to that flower illustration. You know, ladies, that your husband brings you flowers home, and that's the greatest thing in the world. Unless he's done everything wrong all day long, and he walks in the door with those flowers, and he goes, here, I got you flowers, and throws them on the table. Right? You get it. All of a sudden, the attitude matters. <laughs> Somebody goes, oh, he bought you flowers. And you're like, yeah, it's not really cutting it today. Or perhaps, as a parent, you know what it's like to encourage your children politely and kindly to clean their room, only to hear the door slam and things to get thrown. All of a sudden, we discover, oh, magically, it turns out that the attitude behind it matters, doesn't it? Well, the attitude matters, the heart matters in our relationship with the Lord. And the gospel begins to first work in our heart. He begins to change our desires and our passions. Y'all, if you've been a Christian for five years and you don't look more like Jesus today than you did five years ago, maybe you haven't been a Christian for five years. Because the gospel changes us. So I, I encourage you, I urge you today that if you've not seen positive growth in your spiritual life, Today, rather than just hearing this sermon, I pray that you would allow the Word of God to sink deep into your soul. That you would look into the mirror and question your spiritual condition. That you wouldn't leave here today without giving your heart and life to Jesus Christ. The gospel changes. I want you to be changed by the gospel. The second thing this morning I want, I want you to behave like a follower of Jesus. Behave like like a follower of Jesus. Now, this is interesting because you're in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. He says, blessed are the merciful. This is what Christians should look like. They should be merciful people. They should be merciful. Listen, the action of the Holy Spirit should bring about an equal reaction in the lives of Christians. We're right back to our Isaac Newton example, right? When the Holy Spirit begins to work in our lives, the reaction of that, the result of that should be changed Lives As the Holy Spirit works on our heart and our attitude, the conviction of sin and the sanctification of the Holy Spirit brings about lives that should result in us acting more like Jesus. Now look, sanctification, that's one of those big church words. If you didn't grow up in church, maybe you don't know what it means. So sanctification just is the process whereby God works in our lives to make us more like Him. Now, the other thing that you might not be 100% comfortable with or understand is when I talk about Holy Spirit. So what's really great about our church right now is a lot of people are wandering in here that don't have a lot of background in the church. And when I say Holy Spirit, you're thinking about Casper the Friendly Ghost. But the Holy Spirit, the Bible teaches us that God exists as a trinity, three persons in one. And so you've got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we don't have time for a full di di dissection of the Trinity here this morning. But just to understand that, that God exists as our Heavenly Father. God exists as the Son in Jesus Christ. And God exists as the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, or Jesus taught us, before he was going to ascend and go back to the Father. He said to his disciples, one of our family verses, he said, I won't leave you as orphans, but I will send the Helper to be with you. And that Helper is the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. That's the Greek word. It's one of the few Greek words I got down pat but it means the helper and he sent this helper to be with us and the bible teaches us about the coming of the holy spirit in acts chapter 2 we looked at that last year as we worked our way through the book of acts and so the promise of god's word is that when we become followers of jesus when jesus saves us from our sin that the holy spirit comes into our life are we still tracking okay the holy spirit comes into our life and the holy spirit begins the process of molding us and making us into the image of jesus we begin to look more like jesus as a result of that, and as a result of his work, we begin to behave more like Jesus. One of the greatest ways I know to explain this or illustrate it is in my own family. Some of you, many families, we got about 16 families, I think, at my last count, who have either fostered or adopted in one way, shape, form, or fashion. That's awesome. Um, and so we, 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 we have two children by adoption in our own home. Um, they're pretty awesome, pretty proud of them. But what's really amazing is that it doesn't take that long before they begin to act like me. God bless them. <laughs> right? Um, and uh, and, and, and it's, they, they begin to dress like, I mean, all of a sudden you look around and, and man, we're just like little, little copies of one another. 
That's, that's what happens when you begin to invest your love and your life into another person. When, when, the, when the Lord begins to invest His love and His life through the Holy Spirit into our lives, we begin to look more like Jesus. We begin to act more like Jesus. We begin to behave more like Jesus. But look at this. This behaving like Jesus means not behaving like the world. And that's challenging. And it means not behaving the way that I want to behave. In my flesh. It, it actually means that over time as God works, we begin to see our desires shift so that you're going to have some things happen one day. And you're going to be, man, I can't believe that that's what I wanted. Y'all, any of y'all ever had that as a follower of Jesus? Like over one day you, you went, man, why? I, 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 something changed. Some of y'all were, were redeemed out of a life of addiction. And you know what it's like to wake up one day and go, well, that's gone. How did that happen? Some of y'all know that. Well, the Holy Spirit works to mold us into His image. And so one of those aspects is mercy, being merciful. But listen, of all the Beatitudes, being merciful is going to be one of the most challenging ones we deal with. And it's uncomfortable, and this is the reason. Mercy is never proactive, it is always reactive. I don't get to come up to you and go, I think I'd like to show you mercy today. I don't get to be merciful to you until you slap me in the mouth. Until you offend me, until you do something wrong. Now, I said this in the first service. I want to say it in this one. Don't try me on this on the way out the door. I would really appreciate it if nobody slapped me in the face to give me an opportunity to be merciful. It would honor me. I would feel really blessed if y'all didn't do that. But you understand that I can only show mercy when I have been wronged. Mercy is giving exactly the good that a person does not deserve. Mercy is not giving or issuing out punishment or revenge even when someone deserves it or has theoretically earned it. Mercy is not popular in the world around us. You're not going to show mercy and find the world around you celebrating. Listen, when we need mercy, we are the greatest advocates of mercy on planet Earth, right? How many of us know what that's like? Please don't do this to me. But when we're the ones who have been wronged, we have zero interest in giving that same mercy unless Jesus has been at work in our lives. Y'all, mercy's hard because it's a decision that you make when someone has wronged you, when they've slapped you, when they've stolen from you. And it's in that moment that you choose to respond, not according to what is deserved but according to a decision to extend mercy why in the world should or could we do that well doing preaching this sermon on a day when we're going to observe the lord's supper is an excellent reminder for us we show mercy for the glory of god and for the good of the world around us we show mercy so that we can say to the world I'm choosing to do this to honor my Savior who did not punish me when I deserved it, but instead gave me grace. To behave like a follower of Jesus. And third, this morning, I want you to respond inappropriately for the glory of God. In your bulletin, it says, to the glory. That's a typo on my part. It should say, for the glory. I I want you to seek to be the kind of person where others say, wow, why did he do that? Why would he act that way? Except like in a good way, okay? I I want you to shock the world with costly love. Do y'all know how easily we are offended anymore? And look, all y'all are like, all of them are offended, right? I, I love it. We, every, all the snowflakes get so easily offended, okay? And they, they're, they're so soft. All right, you ready for this? How many of y'all get ticked off when you have to wait more than two and a half minutes in the checkout line to grocery store? Really? Y'all are not better than that. Some of y'all are pretending like that's not true. I was at a store the other day. I went to a grocery store. I was at a store. I went to check out. There was like six people there. Um, in line, the only thing that was open was the self-checkout aisle. I don't like the self-checkout aisle. I especially don't like it when the people in front of me can't figure out how to operate the self-checkout aisle. And I literally had one item. And there's all these people managing all this stuff in front of me. And I began to get a little bit, let's just call it anxious. Let's, let's be honest, a little frustrated. 
And right? I, I begin to recognize that I'm ticked off. Now, I wasn't, I wasn't angry at the people standing in line with me. But I, was, I was frustrated with the people managing this, this store that, that thought that it was the best idea for them to only have this open and, and not to be taking care of all the customers in there. Do, do you realize that I probably had to wait, I mean, no kidding, maybe two and a half minutes. And yet, I was ready to be so frustrated about that whole situation because I had to wait two and a half minutes. And y'all aren't any better than me, even though y'all are all sitting in judgment against me right now. We are so easily offended. And as a result of our easy offensive, easy offensive, as a result of that, we tend to want to lash out. You know, I need to speak to the manager because I had to stand in line for two and a half minutes. Really? Is that who we want to be? What's it look like for us to extend, instead to extend mercy in the small areas of life? Not just in the big things, right? But for us to not be concerned about how it is that we have supposedly been offended or supposedly been injured. For us to be more concerned with blessing the people around us than we are with getting what's, what's mine. That I'm more concerned with how it is that I represent Jesus well to the world around me than I am with how it is that the world perceives of me. Listen, when you become a merciful person, you will be mocked by others. You will. There are other people that are going to not understand why it is that you'll allow somebody to steal from you and you don't prosecute them. right? While you'll have this experience happen in your life and you don't sue somebody over it. There's going to be people that just can't wrap their brain. They're going to call you weak. They're going to mock you for it. And yet, in the process of all of that, you have an opportunity to testify to the goodness of a God who sent His Son Jesus to die for you when you deserve nothing but eternal punishment and wrath. We need to respond inappropriately for the glory of God. And part of that response means to seek to do unto others as Christ has done unto you. Our kids are going to be coming in a minute. Don't let them distract you too much. We want them to participate in the Lord's Supper with us. So uh, nothing's wrong. They're just coming to join us. Uh, But as we seek to do unto others as Christ has done unto you. We are all by nature children of wrath. The Bible teaches that we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And as a result of our sin, we deserve punishment. We are separated from God because of our sin. And yet, in the midst of that, God, who is rich in mercy and patient and kind, has extended to us not only grace to give to us a wonderful gift of salvation, but mercy to not make us suffer through punishment on the way there. He loves us this way. And He calls us as His ambassadors to the world around us to extend mercy to others. Y'all, this is what it looks like to live this blessed life that Jesus has called us to in Matthew chapter 5. And it's, it's in light of this that we are going to observe the Lord's Supper today. Um, We do this regularly here in our church body, and I want to explain a little bit about it, Um, and we're going to tie it back in with our sermon. The first thing is, I I want to say to you that the the Lord's Supper is reserved for those who have trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. If you're here today, and you don't know Jesus, you don't follow Christ as your Savior, I'm thrilled to death that you're here. I'm so grateful, and I believe that God puts you here for a purpose. But I would ask you, do not take the Lord's Supper with us. Instead, here's what I would invite you to do. After we've taken this, in just a few minutes, we're going to sing a song. And during that, I'm going to give an invitation. I'm going to invite you to come and give your life to Jesus. And today, if you don't know Jesus, rather than taking the Lord's Supper, I want you to take Jesus as your Savior. I want you to be changed and transformed by the power of the gospel. So I would encourage that first. The second thing, if you have children who do not yet know Jesus as their Savior, I would encourage you, do not, do not allow them to take the Lord's Supper today. And say, kids, we're so glad that you're in here. Parents, I want you to use this as an opportunity to teach your kids about the gospel. The Bible teaches us that this is a visible representation of the broken body and the shed blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, parents, I'm so glad that the kids are in here. We encourage them to be in here as a part of this. But I want you to use this as an opportunity to teach them what it means to be a follower of Jesus.
All right. Having said that, our deacons are going to come forward and just as, and, and as they do, um, let me just explain a few other things. Um, uh, so we we will take the Lord's Supper. We read this passage of Scripture about the Lord's Supper from First um, uh, Corinthians chapter eleven. Uh, but the account of the Lord's Supper, the first time it was observed was by Jesus' disciples on the night that he was going to be betrayed to death. This is the Savior that we serve. And so Jesus gave us this meal as a memorial meal. It's not magic. This is a reminder for us of what Jesus did for us. Okay? And so as we work through this process this morning, if you're new to our church, you've never done this with us perhaps, um, I'll read some scripture our deacons are going to take um, the bread first, and they're going to bring it out and pass it out. Just hold on to that, um, and then we will take that together. And then after they finish, we'll take the cup. I'll read a minute and pray over that. They'll pass it out, and then we'll drink the cup together. And then afterward, we're going to give an invitation, and we're going to sing a hymn together. But uh, that's the way to work. Again, thank you so much for being with us. This is a blessed opportunity for us to reflect upon the grace and the mercy of our God who extended mercy to us when we didn't deserve it, and who calls upon us to extend mercy to others. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul writing, he says that I received, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. Join with me as we pray. Lord God, thank you for the broken body of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you that Jesus died on a cross to save us from our sins. That, Father God, we can experience eternal life in him. In Jesus' name, amen. After you broke it, he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The Bible goes on to say, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And so I assume that what the Bible's teaching us right there is that just as Jesus blessed the bread, he also blessed the cup. Join with me as we pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you so much for the shed blood of Jesus that is represented by the cup that we will drink today. Thank you, Father God, that Jesus was willing to give his life, that we might have forgiveness for our sins. Move among us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. He took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Thank you, man. Just a moment, our, our musicians are going to come and lead us in one final song. And as they do, I want to invite you today. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you today to not be worried about what everybody else around you might think. I want to invite you to not be concerned about what your neighbor might think or your wife or your husband or your children. Not to worry about your parents. I don't want you to be worried about your reputation. Instead today, I want you to be hurt, worried about and concerned for your eternal soul. I invite you today to come to meet Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. To have your now and your forever changed. And for those of you here today who know Jesus, but know that you've not been living a life that has been characterized by mercy. You've not been living a life that displays the fruits of God's work in your life. As we sing, I invite you to come. Whether you'd like for me to pray with you or you'd like to pray at this altar, perhaps there's somebody else in this congregation that you'd appreciate prayers from. As we sing today, don't let today end. Don't let this service end without you giving your life and your business to Jesus Christ. Nothing would give me greater joy today than the privilege 
of seeing some of you come forward and allowing me to help you to meet Jesus Christ. Pray with me today as you stand. Lord God, I love you and praise you and thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for the people who are gathered in this place. Thank you for the word of God that never returns to us void. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who works among us in the shed blood of Jesus that makes it possible for us to be made right, for us to be forgiven and set free. Father, as we've gathered in this place, I pray, Lord God, that you would move among us, that for those here who do not know Jesus, that rather than allowing one more day of excuses to pass, that they could be the day that they can know without a shadow of a doubt that their eternity is secure in Christ. Lord God, would you draw them to yourself? In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining with us here online at Malvern Hill Baptist Church. We would love to get to know you better and to pray with you. If you would like to be contacted for prayer or to find out how to become a follower of Christ, or maybe you just want to find out more about Malvern Hill, please fill out our connection card online at www.malvernhill.org connect. You can also go there to our website. You'll find a lot of information about our church. There's sermons, there's resources, there's other tools that can help you to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You can even give to the work of ministry right there from our website. Thank you so much for being here with us. We hope that you can join us in person very soon. But until that time, I pray that God would bless you in this week as you seek to honor him with your life. I hope to see you soon. Have a great week.